هذه يد معي تمام الحمد لله الشيخ بهذا الشيخ الشيخ احمد عبد الله هو بي ادرس ان توبيك ان شاء الله ايمان يوم المسجد what what this means ان شاء الله هو بي ادرس ديتا but the idea of it is when we're inside the mosque we feel holy we feel spiritual we feel at peace but the moment we step outside subhanallah through all the the hardship which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throws at us we our iman be, begins to weaken or we think that islam is only for inside the mosque and the moment we leave we forget about islam and we go on with our daily routines as if we are no longer muslim or as if islam is only something for these four walls so the, the idea today inshallah is to give an insight into what what this means iman beyond the masjid and the theme of inshallah the week is reviving the sunnah so inshallah shaykh ahmed will be discussing this in light of the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Shaykh Ahmed gave a beautiful talk on Monday, which, oh sorry, Sunday night at the Kaaba Mosque, was about optimism and the importance of optimism. He linked it as well to the Sunnah, how the Prophet himself was an optimist, and what it meant to be an optimist, and how we should conduct that within our lives today in the 21st century. Inshallah, that talk will be up on YouTube uh, very soon. On top of that, also, Shaykh Ahmed will also be giving a talk on Thursday and Friday, Thursday night at Dori Ibn Abbas in Bankstown, uh, Cross Street, 17 Cross Street, Bankstown. There will be a moment and a talk inshallah and on Thursday, uh, sorry on Friday um, after Maghrib also there will be a talk at Dorim Abbas inshallah and that one's entitled the, uh, the importance of servitude I believe I'm striving towards servitude so inshallah if uh, everyone can come and spread the word that would be excellent but there's something which we, we often don't appreciate and one thing is what our Mashiach have done for us because to give up the comfort of this life that we have here in Australia and to go overseas and to live through the hardship. Shaykh Ahmed, mashallah, he studies in Tareem. In Tareem, if anyone's been there, I haven't been there personally, but you, you often hear a lot about it. There's very little electricity. There's no, not much flowing water through the houses. It's a very hard life. You don't have your brick, double brick houses and your air conditioning, etc. You don't have your nice cars to drive around in. It's very hard and it's in the middle of a desert, therefore it makes the conditions even harsher. So this is the hardship which Allah Sheikh goes through just to deliver us. It's not because at the end of the day there is benefit for them, but what's the point of having knowledge and not spreading them? Imam Shaddad was one of the companions of Salah al-Din Ayyubi and he said that Salah al-Din Rahimahullah, one time he said that there are people who walk in this life as if wealth to them is like dirt. And he said that when, when he heard, when he heard it, Salah al-Din say this, he knew that he was speaking about himself. Although he didn't refer to himself out of humbleness, but he knew he was speaking about himself. And these are people who, every, whatever it is they have, whatever means they have, they give for other people. And this is the Al-Mashiach, that they, they go and they strive and they go through hardship and effort to seek the deen, leaving the comforts that we have, and inshallah to bring it back to us and to spread this. And this is what Shaykh Ahmed is for. And uh, inshallah we can all gain benefit from his words throughout the week, uh, especially today inshallah. Jazakumullah. Yeah.
أن تعطينا الأوصاف التي تمتد من من كملت له أوصافه الحسنة نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم أمن لنا منه اللهم أمن عقولنا منه اللهم أمن علمنا من علمه وأخلاقنا من أخلاقه يا رب العالمين اللهم يا حي يا قيوم أوصل قلوبنا بطيبه صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم حنن قلبه علينا يا رب العالمين اللهم زدنا محبة له اللهم زدنا اتباعا له اللهم زدنا نصرة له ولسنته صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم اجعلنا إخوانا له يا رب العالمين اللهم يا رب العالمين أنزل علينا السكينة والرحمة والطمأنينة يا رب العالمين في مجلسنا هذا في مسجدك هذا يا رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله All praises due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Again we find ourselves in one of his houses the houses in which his name is mentioned and the houses where people come in order to be treated. For you go to this house and to that house. You go to the hospital, hospital in order to treat your bodies. And that reminds us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shed mercy, rahmah and forgiveness upon the grandmother of our brother Bilal who passed away uh, recently, yesterday. Yesterday, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her first night in Qabr to be the best night that she, she has ever experienced in her entire life. May that first night that she experienced in the Qabr be a night in which the angels of mercy came upon her and asked her the precious and gentle questions in which she would answer with flying colors and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have opened for her a door into the windows of Jannah al Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us yet again in order to see one another's faces such that we can extract and derive from the barakah and the khayr, the love and the goodness and the light that each person has. For each person that has la ilaha illallah, he has a particular light, which the, the one who is void of la ilaha illallah has no light. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, he says, if the light of the uh, the sinning believer, al mu'min al asi if the light of the sinning believer was to be unveiled, he says it would have filled the entire universe. If this is the mu'min, has iman, he has la ilaha illallah in his heart, but he does the haram, he does the mukhalaf, he doesn't listen to what Allah says, he doesn't do his salah, doesn't do his siyah, but he has iman, he calls himself mu'min. Such a person, he has a light in him, but that light is still veiled. If it would be unveiled, it would envelop the entire earth, the entire universe. So how about the moment that comes to pray Salatul Maghrib in Jama'ah, in some masjid, in uh, Western Sydney, in Kabramatha, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How about the Muslim that comes uh, to the masjid in order to hear the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who recites Quran every now and again, who perhaps gives some salat every now and again, who every now and again smiles with his friends, with his family, with his children, gives gifts, does the khayr. How about this moment? Even higher and higher. But the problem is that we're veiled. We're veiled. And this is different to say Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala. He says, لَوْ كُشِفَ عَنِّ الْغِطَى مَزْدَدْتُ يَقِينَا He says, if the veil were to be removed between me and the unseen world, I would not have increased in yaqeen, in certitude. Because he was a man who was more rabba wa muzakka. Man zakka wa man rabba? Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who was more rabba min qibalillah. The one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him tarbiyah. In the hadith, al-dabani rabbi fa ahsana taddeebi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imparts this tarbiyah taddeeb of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he takes this amana and he takes it to the closest people. His ashia, his tribe, his family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. He says, save yourselves. And fusakum, yourselves, wa ahlikum. And your ashira, your family, your friends, those that are close to you, save them from what? From a torment, from a punishment, from a fire. And so, 
This was Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an, who was the first of the believing youth. Today we are informed there was a brother, mashallah, from Cambodia, that he embraced Islam last week and mashallah announced his Islam and did the shahada. Now mashallah he's learning uh, how to purify himself outwardly, do wudu and tahara, and then how learning how to pray. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, for Allah to guide through you one person to Islam, he says this is better for you than all the Rolls Royces and that beginnings on the earth, the meaning of the hadith. He says it's better than you, because if I tell you the, the hadith, you don't understand. He says that it's better for you than all the red camels. You say red camels, what do you mean? You say that I don't have difference. Blue camels, red camels, white camels, white cows, green cows, no difference to me. It's because you're living far away from the Arabian Peninsula. To them, if they had red camels, it means they had five-story mansions and they had uh, all their Porsche 911s and they had all their fast cars and all the devices that anything, anything that you dream of, they must dream the Arabs. Give them a red camel, they'll be happy. Give them nothing else because the red camel will be their vehicle, will be their transport, it will be their milk, it will be their it will be everything to them, their wealth. This was uh, the, the most uh, valuable thing to them. So the Prophet says, he says, that for Allah to guide through you one person to Islam, He says it's better for you than all the red camels on the earth. So anything that's due to you on earth, no, that one person to accept Islam, to embrace Islam through a word that you say, or an action that you do, or a thought that you think, or a du'a that you petition, Ya Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, that John Smith that sits next to me at work for eight hours a day, I remember speaking to him, guide him to Islam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him to Islam. Like uh, Sayyidina Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, before he became Muslim, what happened? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the beginning of his Islam, of the da'wah in Mecca, and Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra radiallahu ta'ala, Anha, she was still a young girl, she was the fourth. Uh, of the girls, of the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some people ask, they say, why is it Fatima of Zahra is so special to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If you look at the seerah, you find that her three elder sisters end up being getting married early and leaving home, and she is the one that remains in the early years of the Nuhuwa of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and everything her mother experiences and everything her father experiences of challenge, of hardship and difficulty, she's there, living the moment, living the film, because the seerah is a film. It's a film. Everyone likes to watch movies. Everyone likes to watch films, because there's main actors, and there's uh, actors who, characters who are as important, and then there's a plot, and then there's a theme, and then there's a beginning, middle, end, uh, then there's a moral to the story, there's a climax. The scene is like this, it's a film. All of these main characters, the main character is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he has those around him, his family, his daughters, his, uh, his wives, his sahaba, Allah ta'ala anhum. And then you have Act 1, Scene 1, Act 1, Scene 2, Act 1, Scene 3, Act 2, and then you have Interlude. So many things, so many beautiful things happen. But take this little bit by bit because we're here this week to revive the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who, if you want to learn about Iman beyond the Masjid, you don't need to go far. You just go to see the Iman of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam outside the Masjid. But let us go back to Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the account that links us to this brother that accepted Islam and knowing the importance of the dua of the mu'min for guiding people to Islam. So, this young girl, Fatima, perhaps under 10 years of age at this particular point in time, is out there in Masjid al Haram and then. The, of course, every movie has an arch enemy, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, he was named Abu Hakam before, <coughs> the man of decision or wisdom or rule or judge. Uh, but he was then called by the Muslims, no, you don't deserve this. Because uh, the truth comes to you, you don't accept. And you continue to oppress and be a man of tyranny. He becomes Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance. So this Abu Jahl, he comes and because he's so angry with Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
and how he's come to change their ways and to change them from the worship of idols and taking people's money without you. He comes and in seeking this revenge, he strikes this young girl, Fatima. Her so his hurt. And Fatima Zahra starts to weep. She comes back to who? To Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anytime that someone hurts us, we should go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he is the one that is going to heal our wound. No one else can heal our wound, our wound because he is sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shafid ghidan wa mufarrij al -qurub. He is the one that heals and remedies wounds. And he is the one that will take our difficulties away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the proof of this, for those that don't believe me, is in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the Sahabi comes, he says, Ya Rasulullah, when I make dua, should I allocate of that dua uh, one quarter of the time to make salat on you? He says, that's good, but if you do more, that's good, even better. He says, okay, what about one, one third of my dua that I make? I'll make it salat on Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, that's good, but even more, even better. He says, okay, one half of my dua that I make, I'll make a salat on you, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, that's good, even more better. So he says, man, I'm going to do all my dua, I'm going to convert it to salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, he says, in that case, your sins will be forgiven and your grief will be removed. Allah, for the salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're wondering how to keep your iman beyond the masjid? Don't forget the one who established the masjid. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't think that you coming here or building the masjid or trying to assist in the masjid that this is going to help you in your iman. Yes, it will. But do not forget the father, the ahl al for the people of father and virtue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Fatima Zawa comes weeping to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She says, oh my father, oh my father. He says, what's wrong, what's happened? She says to him, that man Abu Jahl, he came and did such and such to me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells him, go to Abu Sufyan and tell him what happened. And at that time, Abu Sufyan was one other than Islam. He wasn't Muslim at that time. And so she goes, she goes to Abu Sufyan, who's also one of them, of Quraysh, of those who took the Prophet sallallahu at that time as an enemy. And she goes to him and she says something such happened with this Abu Jahl, he did this and that. And so Abu Sufyan, he goes and he says, let's go find this man. He goes to Abu Jahl, he goes to Abu Jahl, finds him, knocks on his door, bang, 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 go, and me, Abu Sufyan, opens the door. He says, okay, Abu Jahl, let's say that we have differed with her father with regarding religion and creed and belief. What on earth has she got to do with this story? Why you harm her? Because we have differed with her father. And so Abu Sufyan takes his fist, boom, hits him, and he falls to the floor. This uh, Abu Jahl falls to the floor. Fatima Zahra watching him, wonderful. Ah, this heart of hers has been restored. And she goes back to who? To Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything bad that happens, she goes to her father. Anything good that happens, she goes to her father. So likewise, a Muslim, O oh, follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anything bad that happens in your life, go back to him. And anything good that happens to your life, go back to him. And whether you go back or you don't, whether you believe you should or you shouldn't, don't worry. Because your deeds anyhow are presented to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he says in the hadith, he says, Hayati khayrun lato wa mamati khayrun lato. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the Sahaba, he says, you know, my being amongst you, walking the streets, living with you, being alive with you. He says, this is actually good for you. And also my death is also good for you. So I was in also Allah. We know when you're alive with us, revelation comes upon you, you teach us our commandments and revelation and everything, instructions in our life. No, this is beneficial for us. What do you mean? It is also, your death is good for us. They don't understand. So they question Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, a lesson for us. If you hear something, but you don't understand, see clarification. Because the problem may arise that you think you understood something, but not according to the way that the speaker intended. So they said, so the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, he says in his barzakh, in his qabr, he says, the deeds of his ummah are presented to him. And that which he sees of good, 
He thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. He says, Ali, the son of Zayd in uh, Kabramala, on the 8.30 p.m. came, he had prayed Mal Salat al Maghrib and he was listening to talk and trying to increase in his iman. So Rasulullah says, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For every individual deed of every individual, follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's like a, uh, a report that's sent to him because he's the uh, he's the uh, CEO of the company of Islam. And of course any employee or any uh, executive uh, in some company, they must uh, report back to those that are higher than them. And the highest one in the realm of creation, his name is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So everyone must report back to him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that brings the report back to him. Whether you like it or you don't, you know, the reports are going to be sent to him. And then he says, and that which is other than it, meaning other than what? And look, his adab sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't even mention bad. He didn't say that which is bad. He says, and that which is other than it, meaning other than the khayr, he says, I make this dear far to Allah for them. So no, you do good, he's with you, and even if you do good, and you forget your shukr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَذِيْنَنَّكُمْ He says, if you thank Allah for what he's given you, he's given you a blessing, لَأَذِيْنَّكُمْ And Islam, in Arabic Islam, in Tawqeer, the emphatic lamb, meaning, when you're on your word processor, and you want to emphasize something, what do you do? You put bold. You put 25 size, point size, you make underline, italic, green, blue, orange, highlighting, flashing. Why? Because you want to emphasize. But in the Quran, there's no such thing as bold or highlight, yellow, underline, italic. It's all one script. So Allah uses this tool in the Arabic language, and now at the beginning of a verb. So it's guys, you don't know. Surely. In case there are those people who doubt, there's always people who doubt. Think some people have iman, unfortunately they doubt. So, from the eloquence of the Arabic language, they say that if you feel that the listener may doubt the words of the speaker, the speaker should include an emphatic term to wipe away any inkling of doubt that may occur within the listener. So, the Prophet ﷺ, he thanks Allah, praises Allah for the good, even if you yourself, you're so immersed in the blessing that you don't realize that it's Allah that's given you the blessing. So upon the Prophet ﷺ receiving Sayyidah Fatima and her good news and her reporting back to him of what had occurred in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Allahumma la tatrukha li abi sufyan. He says, Oh Allah, do not leave this favor that Abu Sufyan has offered to her without recompensing him. Allah Akbar. And so we find many years later, in the ninth year of Hijrah, during the Fatih of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes with all Issa, with all dignity, honor, power, nobility, glory, with 12,000 of his army from Medina, and enters Mecca, and on his nata, on his beast, he comes into this very place of the people who, who cast him out and refused to accept him and to torture and persecute him and who ended up boycotting for a number of years. It was called Shahab Shahab Abi Talib, where they gave them no food, they gave them no water, they would not buy anything nor sell them anything, nor would they allow them to intermarry, nothing. And so this was the point where Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu anha also, before the hijrah, she fell ill during this boycott. And they, the scholars of Sirah, they say, in fact, this was what led her to her death, radiallahu ta'ala an Sayyidina Khadija. And so the Prophet said, upon his entrance into Mecca and the Masjid al-Haram, and he then addresses the people of Quraysh, their chiefs and their tribes, and the arch enemies that were there in Act 1, Scene 1 before. Now another act has occurred, the curtains have been unveiled, and he says, he says, ماذا تظنون أني فاعل بكم? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, what do you think that I'm going to do to you today? I have my army, I have my power, I have my weapons, I have my Islamic state, and you come, and you, before all these years, you persecuted all of us? What do you think 
من الدليل نعم اي سي انت اخو كريم ابن اخ كريم يو انه هو برافو بس انا ابن هو برافو And this is what the uh, the oppressors do when they find that they're cornered. They have no choice except to humble themselves. And so the Prophet وسلم, says with his great majesty, He says, Go, for you are free today. He says, He who enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. He who enters the masjid is safe. He who enters the home of such and such is safe. Meaning, even though they came and they persecuted us whilst we're in Mecca, we're not going to do anything to them. Because the Prophet has given this, this aman, this safety, this, uh, what do you call, they call it nowadays in the uh, political terminology, political asylum. Some people say that the Prophet was a terrorist. Let's see what he did when he came and conquered this country. When you go and you conquer various countries, not conquest, they invasion. What do you go and do to their leaders? You go and hang them, don't you? That's what the enemies of Islam do. But what did Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam do? The one you call, you call a terrorist, the one you say he spread Islam by the sword, the one that you say he, call, he taught his people how to be barbaric. What did he come to do to his enemies? He says, "Go." He says, "I'm not going to crucify you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to assassinate you." He says, "You're free." This was the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And it was in that year and after that moment that the story unfolds that uh, Abu Sufyan ends up becoming Muslim. But how did he become Muslim? As a result of that dua of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as the uh, the Muslims were in the area of Mecca, uh, one night Al Abbas sees Abu Sufyan and he takes him on his donkey on the back of his donkey, trying to take him back to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Encamped just outside of Mecca, and he quickly passes by during the middle of the night, so that no one can see him. Uh, and passes by someone who you see that say Umar ibn Khattab. He quickly passes him by in order to ensure that Umar doesn't see him, because he knows if Umar saw Abu Sufyan, he'll be off with his head. You will see that Abu Sufyan is enemy of Islam. But Abbas, he will be the guidance of Abu Sufyan. So he goes and takes him to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه And after Isha, the Prophet صلى الله عليه he invites him. He says, Abu Sufyan, isn't it time now that you become Muslim? That you make shahada la ilaha illallah and upon Rasulullah? He says, yeah, the first one, no problem. But the second one, still I have something in my heart against it. Meaning this Muhammad Rasulullah business still hasn't entered my heart, hasn't entered my mind, can't accept it. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says to that Abbas, his uncle, he says to him, take him away and bring him back in the morning. So, in the morning, as Abu Sufyan is awake and brought by Abbas, and then he witnesses what's going on. He witnesses what's going on, if you like, this open message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And so he sees people going and washing themselves, making this wudu, and then lining up in lines, in rows, and then in front, there is this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and then he hears the adhan, and then the uh, takbir of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahu Akbar, and he sees everyone else making takbir behind him, Allahu Akbar, and then he looks who are in Qiyam and Sujood and so on, until they finish the prayer. And then Abbas again brings up to Sufyan, and by that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, shalom, sallallahu He opened his chest and heart to the beauty of Islam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he witnessed how they respected him and it was said by him or one of, another one of Quraysh previously that he says, "Ma ra'aytu ahadan yu'adhimu ahadan mithla ashab Muhammad Muhammad." They said he says, "I've never seen any person revere or respect or magnify any other person like the companions of Muhammad respect and revere Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam." This was the iman. That is Iman in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was what led them to the Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Sufyan finally accepts and embraces Islam. And he becomes one of those who gave victory to the deen. And so this dua, why we mention this? The dua of the Muslim, the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was then accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these uh, un 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 unfolded and this man finally became a Muslim. So there is a barakah and there's a sir and there's a, a blessing and a secret in the dua of the believer. Now in the introduction when Brother Hisham was, uh, was talking about 
uh, Iman beyond the Masjid that we feel when we're in the Masjid we have so much Iman and so much faith but outside the Masjid sometimes it differs why is this? you 1430 40 years after the time of the Sahaba and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you feel this but don't think you're the only ones the Sahaba themselves they felt this and one of the Sahaba whose name was Handala he comes out and he says, he says, I can't take this anymore. He comes out of his house, he says, I can't take this anymore. He says, he goes out of the house and on the street he says, Na faqa handala, na faqa handala. He says, handala has become a hypocrite. Handala has become a hypocrite. Handala has become a hypocrite. And he says, who's he says, he says in the street, he says, I walk in. Oh, says, what's going on? Where are you going? He says, I'm going to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Handala has become a hypocrite. He's going, what do you mean he's become a hypocrite? He says, he says, when I'm with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when I'm with the Sahaba in the masjid, he says, I feel my Iman is so, so strong, so high. I have firm belief in Allah, it's like I see Jannah, like I see now, all these beautiful things. He says, when I come back home with my family, with my children, back to work, I don't feel that. I feel like a hypocrite. Allah says, you know what? I feel exactly the same thing. Oh, <laughs> so it's not just you people now who have university and have uh, business and have work, work that you're feeling this. No, this is something natural. So, Alhamdulillah goes hand in hand with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and remember Abu Bakr is who? The one whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a testimony regarding, gave him shahad. Some of you, if you uh, go to, uh, excuse me, uh, Harvard with a PhD and then you have this uh, degree and uh, you hang it up on the wall and everyone comes to you and say, look, I've got a PhD from Harvard, got a PhD from Oxford, got this from, oh, shahad from this institute, you become, mashallah, mashallah. Or you graduate with first class honors, or no, you're untouchable now, we can't speak to you. Um, or you now have been promoted to chief financial officer of this particular of, the, of Telstra, of Australia, because, oh, mashallah, we can't speak to you now. You have this, uh, this shahada, this degree. But what if you're given a degree by the one who has the highest of degrees, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How many of you seek this degree? Sayyidina Abu Bakr was given this degree. Uh, and this degree, was not gained or earned by much prayer and fasting, but rather something which had settled in the heart of Abu Bakr. And by Allah was nothing more or less than his love for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah which brought him to be the chosen one to accompany Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his hijrah from Mecca to Medina, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed the rest of the Sahaba to proceed him in their hijrah and that, that batal, that uh, what do you call, brave man, courageous man, Omar, he is the only one that went out in the open. He goes to the heart, outside the Kaaba, takes out his sword, he says, any one of you that wants to be, have their women, widows, you want, who wants his wife to be a widow and who wants his children to be orphans, come right now. I'm going to make hijrah to Medina. No one comes to him. What does it mean? You mean, anyone, you want to come now? That's fine. I'm going to make Hijrah. You got a problem with it? Come on. This was Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And most of the Muslims, they made it in secret. And the Prophet also made it in secret. With Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. And for those nights in which he spent in the Ghar, in that Ghar, Thaw, in the cave of Thaw, which is high up on a mountain. And that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran that it was Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was their third. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his sakin and his tranquility and his serenity. And Abu Bakr, before they entered the cave, not to the extent of his sacrifice for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was brought about through his extensive love for him, he ensured that he entered the cave first and he blocked off all of the openings in the cave, such that there would be no scorpions or no snakes that would come and hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, when he went in, Rasulullah came, there was only one opening left in the cave. And so he blocked it off with his foot. And it was that foot which was then, uh, what do you call, stung. Stung by a scorpion or snake or something. But because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sleeping on his lap, he refused to move for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So imagine, 
that which would have increased and which would have fell for Rasulullah Sallallahu during those days and those nights. But Abu Bakr was the one who the Prophet Sallallahu said regarding him and he gave him his degree. First class honors degree, straight to the top of the class, he says, he says, if the Iman of the entire Ummah was to be placed on one side of the scales and the Iman of Abu Bakr was to be placed on the other side, the Iman of Abu Bakr would have overtaken or overweighed or be more than the Iman of the entire Ummah. Allahu Akbar. This was Sayyidina Abu Bakr, the one of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was in his mother's or nose, he was uh, in his uh, final days uh, of his life, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says to Aisha, Aisha, he says to her, go tell Abu Bakr to lead the Muslims in prayer. And Aisha, she says, oh, Abu Bakr is very soft, anything, the slightest thing will make him cry, he's going to make a good Iman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he insisted that Abu Bakr be the Imam uh, during the sickness of the prayer and Aisha was saying this because she knew that the Sahaba would refuse to accept anyone as an Imam other than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so she didn't want her father to be on the receiving end of attacks of Sahaba but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's moral, his intention and his desire was other than that and this was the story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr that man of great Imam but Abu Bakr was the one who was the cause of the emancipation and freedom of Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sayyidina Bilal, who was a slave from al-Habasha, from Ethiopia. He was in Bilal al-Habashi. And uh, his master at that time, one of the kuffar, Umayyad bin Khalaf, uh, he was bought out by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr was a wealthy man and he used his wealth to free this slave, this Muslim, who would spend his days lying down in the middle of the desert with the huge boulder rock on his chest, being whipped by Umayyah and his uh, cronies, saying, you must leave your faith, and he's saying, Ahadun, Ahad, Ahadun, Ahad, the one, the one, the one, Allah, and then later on, Oh, many years later, the Sahaba came and they said to him, oh, Bilal, they said, didn't you feel so much pain, so much difficulty uh, when you were being persecuted under the scorching sun with the whipping and with the, the, the heat and with the, the rock upon you and the, the, the torture that they used to do to you? And so, Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a person who is a symbol of pure iman and faith, he says, he says, by Allah, I mixed the bitterness of the persecution with the sweetness of Iman and the sweetness of Iman overtook and overpowered the bitterness and the difficulty of the torture and persecution so he felt nothing but sweetness when he was under there under the rock being whipped under the sun saying Ahadun Ahad how beautiful that word was Ahadun Ahad but how many of us recite Qulhu Allahu Ahad Allah was summer, lam yelid wa lam yulid wa lam yakun lahu kunaha and not a, what do you call, not a hair on our skin moves uh, no change in our heartbeat there's no effect Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says ذَاقَ طَعْمَ الْإِيمَانِ مَنْ رَضِيَ بِاللَّهِ رَضَّى he says he has tasted the sweetness of Iman the one who is pleased to have Allah as his Lord of Islam Iman and who is pleased and happy and content to have Islam his faith wa bi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nabiyya wa rasula and he's happy to have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his prophet and his messenger this is what the iman does it transforms a person but we're not going to reach this level until we are conscious upon leaving our own homes when we leave our home how do we leave in what state with what words and with what intentions. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to give us such simple instructions. But unfortunately, these simple instructions are left. And Muslims, they forget about them. And they look too bigger, more intellectual, uh, greater things in their mind. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, he who leaves his home 
and upon his leaving, says, Bismillah, Tawqaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There will be angels that will come over him, hover over him, and they will say, Budita wa wudita wa kufita. They will say, you will be guided for your whole day until you come back. You will be protected in your whole day until you come back. And this will be sufficient for you for your whole day until you come back. So no, no shaitan will have any influence or control or power over him whatsoever. These three words. Bismillah. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. These words have an effect. But they must be said with tasdeeq with belief, with Iman, knowing that they are going to uh, change your way. Just like a person, psychological as well, a person who uh, perhaps uh, is ill and he goes to the doctor and uh, tells him his, uh, his ailment and the doctor diagnoses him. The doctor says it's not a really serious uh, uh, condition and so he gives him some syrup, let's say, and he says, do no, you take this syrup three times a day and uh, you'll be cured. So he goes and takes this three times a day for how many days? He comes back and he's fine. He comes back to the doctor. The doctor says, you know what's in the syrup? He says, no. He says, just plain water and perhaps color or some sugar. Nothing. But the person believed that there's a cure in this. So there becomes a cure. Just like a, a story that was given uh, of a man who he used to have a shop. And uh, in this shop, he used to have valuables that he used to sell. However, uh, whenever he used to come back at, during, the, during the day to open his shop, he would find that someone had broken in and stolen all his valuables. And he started to complain, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I locked up and everything. And someone comes and breaks in in the evening and he takes my things. And so he goes to some shape. And this shape, he approaches him, he tells him, look, such and such happens. Please help me, what can I do? So he says to him, he says, when you lock up the shop at night, he says, before you lock up, recite Ayat al Kursi 360 times. Okay. So the man is not a knowledgeable person. It's a normal scholar. So uh, he goes, uh, he goes to the shop in the evening, he closes up, he closes up, and uh, does what he has to do, and uh, goes away. He goes away and he finds that the next morning, the next morning, then everything is fine. No one has broken in, no one has taken any of the valuables, everything remains as is. Uh, he ends up observing one of the nights who it was that comes. He finds that they put the people come. After he's done his, uh, his work that he was given by the shade, they come and they look inside through the doors to the windows and then they go away. They don't go in and break in. And so he's able finally somehow to get in touch with them. And he says to them, look, for so many times, you used to go, you used to break into the shop, you used to steal and uh, take what you, what you wish. Uh, he says, but now you went, you refused to go in. He says, what's the story? They said, uh, this time when we went to break into the shop, he said, when we looked inside, we saw all the valuables had turned into chairs, Kalasi, so many of them. And so what are we going to do with chairs? No value, no point to us. And so they went away. So they said to him, what did you do? What is it that you've done? He says, oh, I did nothing except uh, I complained of this problem to some chef. And he said, before you lock up in your shop, he says, recite Ayat al Kursi 360 times. <coughs> and he says, oh, the night. He says, oh, I don't know. when I lock up, I said, I had to cross the eye, 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 cross the eye. Three hundred six times I mentioned I had to cross the eye, cross the eye, cross the eye, cross the eye. Ah, they said you silly person. I had to cross the means the eye of Quran. Allah Hu La Ilaha Illa Hu Hayyul Qayyum. That the Quran is not true. No, 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 no. It's not true. But she said I had to cross it. But because of his sincerity, his belief that the effect and the secret was in the words I had to cross it, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala placed the blessing in them. So according to your intentions, you will be rewarded. This is the way. So our Iman in certain things makes a difference in our life. So the Iman of the Prophet was the greatest of Iman, the highest of Iman. And uh, this takes us back, we said, Hamdallah, with, with, with who? Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. 
many of today. Last week is uh, doing haram, and this week, mashallah, is in the masjid five times a day, and is mu'takif. Alhamdulillah, beautiful. However, this deed is vast, and he who enters into the depths of this deed immediately, then he will be destroyed. You have to take things step by step. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he trained his sahaba in this particular way. And so three men. They each make a decision upon themselves. And so one of them says, he says, yes, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, uh, uh, in his, his particular ibadah, he uh, prays some of the night, and then he sleeps perhaps some, or he uh, fasts some days, and he doesn't fast some days, and he also marries women. So one of them says, he says, as for me, I am going to spend my entire night in ibadah, in qiyam. I'm not going to sleep the night at all. And another one of them says, 